And hopefully you're all here for the child sexual exploitation webinar. Um, the warning signs were all there, but no one noticed recognising and responding to child sexual exploitation. Um, there's a, quite a few people that I do recognise here, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jo, um, I'm Jo Ritchie. I'm an advanced social worker specialist in child sexual exploitation, um, working within Bristol City Council within the Safer Options Hub. Um, just a little bit about me before we start. So I've got about 13 years of experience working within the field of sexual exploitation. The first four was with adults in Bristol, mainly with street sex workers. And um, since then, it's mainly been with children and young people. Um, I've been a CSE social worker for the council since February last year. And prior to that, I worked as a CSE project worker for Bernardo's Space project which is our specialist commission service in Bristol for young people who are sexually exploited. So today the aims of today um, are to kind of have a bit of an understanding of what child sexual exploitation is, think about the current picture in Bristol, to unpick some of the signs for you to be looking out for um, when a young person is being sexually exploited or at risk of it. And then just some thoughts about what you can do if you suspect a child is being sexually exploited, what sort of responsibilities we have when it comes to responding. I always think it's important to start um, these sort of training sessions with a word of caution about the content. I'm imagining that if you've logged in today that you've likely to have supported or known someone who's been impacted by CSE. So please just make sure you look after yourself. It might be that there's um, certain things that we covered today which, which might be quite triggering of things that you've been involved with in the past. So please debrief after, um, feel free to contact me after. My, my contact details will be at the end of the webinar. Um, but mainly engaging good self-care is, is what I want to highlight. I often find that um, even though I've done this for quite a few years, I still get quite affected after doing training sessions because it forces you to reflect. So just be kind to yourselves. So we're going to start by thinking about um, some facts and figures in, in Bristol. So I checked yesterday, we've got um, a, an app called Click, which is the kind of main app that we use to kind of understand the current data in Bristol with child exploitation. Um, yesterday, it, it came up with 168 children who've either got current referrals or early help episodes as, who are identified as at risk of child sexual exploitation. That figure actually represents a really large cohort of young people. So that would include both young people who are identified as being at risk as well as those who we believe are being currently exploited. So that would pull in perhaps siblings of, of young people who've been sexually exploited, or maybe young people who are linked to peers where there are significant current concerns. So what we have found is that there really tends to be around 65 to 80 children at highest risk of child sexual exploitation in Bristol at any one time that we know about. And I think that's really key. It's really hard for us to know the true extent of concerns and that's due to it often being underreported and underrecorded and mainly because it's not identified. I think um, there was some research done in 2019 by Bernardo's which highlights a huge issue that different services use different recording systems which don't really match up and so there's real challenges with collating data across the agencies. Um, we, they also found that we continue to really struggle to identify boys and young men until they're really entrenched. Um, we're not so good at spotting children who've got disabilities and also children from ethnic, um, from minority ethnic groups tend to be lost as well. So this really relies on us recognising the signs and reporting and recording these. So I guess my first plea to you today is if you are concerned about CSE, make sure you name it and record it on assessments, on referrals, on case notes. Be explicit to make sure that these children don't continue to be hidden. So this is a quote um, which is from a survivor. 
from Operation Brook, which was captured within a serious case review that came out of that operation. So um, this young person said, recognise that it is very hard for us to see ourselves as victims and therefore to have any insight into the help that we need. So um, that just highlights my point of what I said before. And I've pulled it out because I think it's important that we um, name Operation Brook. It was a really significant operation that um, took place in Bristol. It was a large scale police investigation um, which began in, I think it was around May 2013 and spanned over about 18 months. Um, it looked into concerns regarding multiple children across Bristol and a surrounding local authority um, and discovered that they were being sexually exploited by an organised network of adult men in Bristol. Um, following two court cases in total, there were 15 men who were convicted of crimes in Crown Court and three were acquitted. Um, so yeah, it's just, I think when we talk about CSE in Bristol, a lot of people refer to Operation Brook, so it's maybe important just to have a bit of an understanding of what they're referring to. So we're just going to start by thinking about the definition of CSE. Um, CSE, I, I'm going to use CSE moving forward because child sexual exploitation is a massive mouthful, so it's just a lot easier to say CSE, but it's actually relatively um, new as a term, uh, about 30 years old. Before that, we were using terms such as young prostitutes and children were being criminalised for soliciting offences. It really wasn't that long ago that that, that change has come about. Um, I would say by 2015, large cases in Rochdale and Rotherham really changed things. And, and now actually there are specialist services accessible in most local authorities. Bristol, I'm um, proud to say, has been ahead of the game really. And we've got our specialist service, Bernardo's Base, Bernardo's Against Sexual Exploitation, which has been around um, for about 25 years. But anyway, this is the latest definition, which was updated in 2017. And we'll just go through that together now. The child sexual exploitation is a form of child sexual abuse. I've highlighted that because that sometimes can get lost. And I think it's really important to name CSE as child sexual abuse. It very much sits within the child sexual abuse arena. It occurs where an individual or group takes advantage of an imbalance of power to coerce, manipulate or deceive a child or young person under the age of 18 into sexual activity. So there's that imbalance of power going on and that's always in favour of the one perpetrating the abuse. And um, that imbalance could be due to their age, their physical size, their status in the community, their access to economic resources, their cognitive ability, um, many, many, many different things. Um, what I also want to really highlight is it says, a child or young person under the age of 18. So that includes 16 and 17 year olds. Um, and that can sometimes get a bit lost, I guess, because the age of consent is 16. Um, you can legally consent to have sex as a 16 year old, but very important to highlight, you can still be a victim of child sexual exploitation if consent is not there. Just in the same way as an adult can be raped, even though they are over the age of consent. Um, so consent is, Huge. And actually, consent is in, it was added into the definition when it was updated just to highlight how important that aspect was to kind of consider. And we'll spend a bit more time thinking about consent in a minute. So it talks about in exchange for something the victim needs or wants. So over years of working, I've seen many things that can um, include food, a place to stay, lift. Are really common, um, perceived protection, perceived love, drugs, alcohol, money, clothes, a winter coat, <laughs> yeah, many, many different things that can be used in that kind of exchange for something that they need or want. Um, and for the financial advantage or increased status of the perpetrator or facilitator. The victim may have been sexually exploited even if the sexual activity appears consensual. So like I said, that's new, that's been updated in this definition. Quite often the grooming process deceives the young person and those around them, and that includes the family, but it also can include 
us as professionals too into believing that they're in a consensual relationship. So they're really, really reliant on us to be really clued up on what consent looks like and, and what it entails um, so that we can support them to understand if consent is not present. Um, child, ex child sexual exploitation does not always involve physical contact. It can also occur through the use of technology. We're going to spend a little bit of time focusing on that form of CSE later on in the webinar. Um, I guess just want to highlight that CSE, um, it can present in multiple forms and it can be perpetrated by individuals, by groups, by boys, by girls, by men, by women. Perpetrators come in all different shapes, sizes, ages, ethnicities. I, yeah, I can't emphasize that enough because I think sometimes we can have um, set ideas of what we think perpetrators look like and the media can be really unhelpful with that. Um, so just be mindful, they come in all shapes and sizes. It can be a one-off incident or a series of incidents over a long period of time. It can be an opportunistic offender um, or it can be a complex organised crime group. It really varies extremely greatly. So just some other, um, I'm just going to highlight a few other definitions that are related to CSC, but also unique in their own right. And I'm, I might refer to some of them in the webinar, so I just wanted to kind of highlight them. So harmful sexual behaviour and peer-on-peer -peer abuse. I think they obviously have similarities and overlap. I think what's really important to highlight is peer-on-peer um, -peer abuse is about harm between young people of a similar age. So you might have a 13-year-old and a 14-year-old, for example. I wouldn't refer to a 13-year-old being harmed by a 17 year old is peer on peer abuse because that really is a significant age gap. Whereas harmful sexual behaviour um, tends to be harmful sexual behaviour from a child of any age towards another child of any age. Um, extra familial harm that encompasses all forms of harm in the community and um, which is not taking place in the family home. Contextual safeguarding, so again, that's kind of you know very much related to extra familial harm. It's, it's an approach to understanding the risk of harm that young people can face beyond their families. Um, its focus is on the relationships that young people form in communities, in their schools and online, um, and how that these can feature in their abuse. So the way that we might respond if we were taking a contextual safeguarding response would be to look at hotspots, so locations where young people are known to be at particular heightened risk of CSE. Um, we might look at peer networks and um, kind of see how, how can we increase safety within that network. Um, the key thing that contextual safeguarding points out is that parents and carers have very little influence over these contexts and young people's experiences of extra familial abuse can undermine the parent-child relationship um, and sadly very often does. And then finally, child criminal exploitation we're aware that there's a lot of similarities and there's a lot of crossover as well with our cohort of children who are sexually exploited and criminally exploited. Um, in brief though, an example of child criminal exploitation might, might be a young person being coerced into being pulled into drug related offending um, in return for status, protection, somewhere to stay and, and so on. So I'm just going to really briefly put a plea out to be mindful of the language. It's really important that we use appropriate language when we're referring to concerns related to CSE. Um, I actually am delivering a separate webinar particularly focused on language. It's called Mind Your Language. Um, and the next one is being delivered on Tuesday next week, the 18th at 2 p.m. So do come to that if you want a bit more support about appropriate language to use and terms to avoid them and why to avoid them. Um, um, I feel like I'm always learning when it comes to language. Um, but I've just pulled out a couple of examples. So I would avoid, if you're kind of writing case notes or in conversations with professionals or families or young people themselves, avoid terms like sexual activity with or having sex with or in a relationship with when we're talking about um, concerns of child sexual exploitation. Um, some alternatives might be you know, he or she has said that they're having sex with and then the name of the, the person of concern. 
However, we are worried that they have been groomed and or coerced. Um, he or she has said that they are in a relationship with so and so. However, there are concerns that they have been groomed, exploited and controlled. So just, just be really mindful that you're really clear of the concerns. Um, otherwise, I think when we are a bit, um, when, when, when we don't think carefully about the language we use, sometimes we can be quite quick to put responsibility on the child and the young person for their abuse, which is absolutely the opposite of what we want to do. Just wanted to pull this out, this highlight um, you know, the Department of Education has, has continued to constantly say it is a priority safeguarding issue. It's a crime. It has devastating and long lasting consequences. Um, and ultimately, the first response to children and support for them to access help must be the best that it can be from all of us. Um, I know that um, we're all from lots of different agencies today, but we are all responsible. So just um, a little bit more about the current picture in Bristol. Um, we continue to see children and young people um, being groomed and impacted by CSE from across Bristol. So that's North, South and East Central. Um, I mentioned before that we continue to struggle with an underrepresentation of boys and young men. Um, and actually within COVID times, we know that boys and young men have been at increased risk, particularly through online. Um, there's been definite concerns raised by the boys researcher at Bernardo's of, of boys and young men being at increased risk and perpetrators really taking those kind of opportunities, knowing um, that uh, they've, they've been online more through lockdown. Um, the South Asian and East African communities tend to be more hidden in Bristol and I think that's very much about us perhaps not engaging as effectively with these communities as we could be. Um, we need to recognise that they face additional barriers due to cultural expectations, religious beliefs, language barriers, fear of shame on the community and therefore we need to work extra hard to get alongside them, engage them and help them understand what CSE is and what's happening. Um, because it's hard enough understanding it anyway, let alone having um, all those additional barriers in place. Um, there's definitely been some reduction in numbers of children being exploited. And in some ways that, that hopefully is a really positive thing. And that could be reflective of increased disruption that we have seen from our specialist police team, Operation Topaz. So um, they are our specialist team within Avon and some of the set police that, that focus primarily on child exploitation. Um, we do know that there are groups that we hear less from, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not being targeted, but more maybe we've got a way to go in how to identify and engage some of those more hidden communities, like what I mentioned before. Um, I think positively, we've definitely made improvements in understanding how peer networks and how peer groups link and sibling groups link and increase vulnerability in terms of being targeted. Um, but we still definitely find that professionals are pushing the concrete evidence, more concrete evidence than we can expect when assessing CSE. Um, we need to help people assess risk on a balance of probability as opposed to evidence based. Um, going to go to another positive. Um, we're much better definitely at recognising the limitations on parents and carers in terms of protecting their children and that very much links in um, our work around contextual safeguarding which Bristol at the moment are um, part of a pilot within with, with the University of Bedfordshire so we're kind of very much on board with that which is great. So we have we've come a long long way I would definitely say so um, but if we don't keep it on the agenda we will fall behind if prioritisation is not maintained so I would say that perpetrators continue to develop their targeting techniques so we need to keep up with them their tactics keep on evolving keep on changing and so we need to be really on it to keep up with what they are so I've just put this slide up just in terms of consent um, I think um, like I said it's been highlighted within the latest definition and it is at Absolutely integral that we have a good understanding of, of consent so that we can then support 
children and young people to understand it. It's, it's one of the biggest barriers to them not recognising abuse. Um, so what I would recommend is become really confident in your understanding of what the law says about consent and then just interweave it in conversations as much as you possibly can and repeat, repeat. There was um, a wonderful young person I worked with for a number of years. He was actually one of the victims within Operation Brook that I mentioned earlier. I've got a very, very vivid memory of driving down Church Road talking about consent for the sixth or seventh session in a row and she was really struggling to get it and we would I was trying lots of different ways of communicating um the concept to her um and then it was like she had a penny drop moment and she just it she suddenly got it and she then said that means I was raped last night and that was the beginning of her disclosing um significant crimes that happened to her um, as part of um, her sexual exploitation by that network. Um, so just so that you can know, I'm just going to do a really, really brief teaching. So um, what the law says, consent is if the person agrees by choice and has the freedom and the capacity to make that choice. So I tend to say to young people, what does choice mean? You can say yes, you can say no, you can change your mind. Um, what affects people's freedom to choose? It could be pressure, it could be fear, threat, force, being unable to get away. Um, capacity, that's a word that not all young people understand, so I tend to swap it with um, being able to, to think clearly. So what gets in the way of being able to think clearly it might be alcohol, drugs, literally being unconscious. Um, learning difficulties can impact capacity. Um, and also, really importantly, we need to explain about um, ages. So obviously the law talks about 16 being the age of consent, but there's also another age which it points out, which is 13. It says under the age of 13, um, even if a young person feels like they're making a choice, that they have got the freedom to make that choice and they think that they can, um, that they're mature enough and old enough to, to, to make that choice around sexual activity. The law really protects them and says, no, actually, they're too young. Um, and so anything under the age of 13 would be um, statutory rape. So just some resources that um, I wanted to just point out to you. I think most of you by now have seen It's Simplicity. It's a really good resource, which I highly recommend showing to young people. It's on YouTube. There's another one called Cycling Through Consent. Um, again, on YouTube, I've probably used that for the slightly older ones. Um, we've got here Sexual Consent, Do You Get It? That's a SARSAS um, resource um, and it's brilliant. Pause, stop, play. And so they've got um, a leaflet or they've got an interactive quiz that you can support young people to engage with on the website. And it looks at how we communicate consent, considering most of it's done through body language. So looking at kind of those cues and, and um, that can be done to support people to understand, you know, to make sure that other people are consenting, but also it can it can be done to help them recognise, do you know what, my body language clearly communicated that I wasn't consenting. So even though I didn't verbally say no, I didn't communicate, can communicate consent. So it, it, it's helpful for kind of both ways, if that makes sense. So we're just going to go through some of the strategies used by perpetrators to sexually exploit children and young people. So the first one that we're going to look at is groups. So the term that is probably most commonly used when referring to this would be gangs. However, I'm really mindful that we don't use the term gang consistently in Bristol. We're really quick to refer to young people from ethnic minorities as being in a gang if they are in East Central Bristol. However, it seems to be that if they live in North Bristol or South Bristol, it's a group, it's a peer group of young people who are engaging in antisocial behaviour. So at the moment, I'm kind of opting for using the term groups just because we need to be really careful that we're consistent. Um, so young people who are particularly at risk of being pulled into these groups um, and, and sexually exploited um, I guess what groups provide is a real sense of belonging. So any young person who is having real challenges at home, uh, facing relationship breakdown with parents or carers, 
maybe they're in care and they have experienced multiple placement moves and they've got um, a real sense of instability. So they're really seeking a sense of belonging. That's what these groups can often um, provide and be really appealing for. Um, young people can be sexually exploited via excuses of initiation into the group or punishment if they've not stuck to the kind of expected rules of, of kind of what's what's required to be part of that group. Um, what I would highlight is BSE is often really intricate, intricately linked to child criminal exploitation um, when it comes to groups. Um, so it could be, for example, that a child is forced or manipulated into sexual activity and moving drugs to organised offenders. Um, we tend to talk about the double bind. So perpetrators can sometimes use CCE as a way of stopping young people from talking about their experiences of CSE. So it could be, for example, that a young person has been pulled into drug related offending. They're carrying a package of drugs to an address. When they get to the address, maybe they're invited in, given some alcohol, and then um, it could be that they are then sexually exploited. What? the person who's controlled them might say is you can't speak to the police because when you speak to the police they're going to ask how you why you were in that address how why you were in that address how you got there um, and actually what you were doing was illegal you were breaking the law you were selling drugs um, so it's a real clever way that they try and keep young people silent and actually what I say to young people is the police are really understanding of that particularly our wonderful Topaz team they really understand how complicated it is and how common it is for young people who are victims of child exploitation to be pulled into criminal activity and actually ultimately they are primarily seen as victims. Trafficking, so um, when I heard this term initially I always used to think very much just of um, external trafficking, so when someone is moved from one country to another but actually um, most of the children that we work with who are sexually exploited are internally trafficked. So trafficking is about the movement from one location to another. So it could be someone could come pick me up from my address and move me to an address in Filton by giving me a bus ticket or paying for an Uber or physically driving me there with the motive for me to then be sexually exploited um, at that address. So that movement would mean that I have been trafficked and actually I, I delivered some training yesterday and someone helpfully talked about actually even being moved within a house from downstairs to upstairs if someone has gone to a party of their own choice um, and then they've been taken upstairs by someone where they've then, be, then been sexually exploited they've, they've been internally trafficked um, so that's yeah it's, it's very much about the movement why do perpetrators use trafficking? One of the reasons I think is because it removes young people from their protective factors. So there was a, a young person that I worked with for a number of years who got trafficked to London and she'd never really had much time outside of Bristol before. So London was this completely new scary place that she'd never been to um, and she was in this really frightening situation and she said to me if I'd been in Bristol, I would have known exactly where to run. I would have known which friend's house to go to. I would have known which shop to go to. I would have even known where the police station was, but I had no idea where I was. And it just felt safer to stay with these people than to try and run because everyone and everywhere felt unsafe. So I guess um, that's quite a, a clever way um, of, of stopping young people from speaking up. Um, yeah, if you hear of young people talking about going to parties, um, maybe they, they're going to hotels, be curious. You know, how is a teenager getting to Birmingham to attend a party? How are they physically getting there? How are they able to book and pay for a hotel room? Be curious, ask questions, check it out with relevant professionals, parents, carers. It could be a trafficking situation. And if that is the case, if you've got the gut that it could be, let the police know immediately so that they can try and disrupt. I've had some amazing examples where the police have been incredible, where I've been really worried. Ah, this child has told me that she's on her way to this party in Swindon and I am really concerned she's being trafficked. And actually they've intercepted vehicles on the motorway, for example, 
where they've then um, charged the perpetrators with trafficking offences. Um, trafficking can also be very, very organised. Um, there was a young person that I worked with who um, she was moved between multiple cities. So she was moved between Bristol to Cardiff to Manchester to London to Nottingham, so many cities. And we had um, a police team really working on her situation. And we knew of over 70 men who had been involved in her exploitation. <laughs> and that was very much being controlled and facilitated by a group of, of perpetrators who were an organised network around the country. Um, what I would say as well, just briefly with trafficking, is if you have got concerns that a child is being trafficked, then we are all what is called first responders. So we need to make sure that either we or we ask somebody else to fill in um, an NRM, so that's the National Referral Mechanism, um, and that help it's an independent body which assesses whether they think that child or young person is a, a victim of trafficking and it can be really helpful um, when it comes to court or maybe if a young person is being criminalized for offenses that they've been pulled into as a consequence of their exploitation it, it just provides that level of protection that they really need from, from being criminalized so online I'm sure you all agree that the online world um, is actually quite scary now. <laughs> we don't have a grip of it and it plays a part in the majority of exploitation. Um, children and young people can be targeted and exploited through gaming, social media, chat rooms. Um, what I would say is I think when I started this work, I had um, a very naive belief that perhaps children who are exploited online, it wasn't as bad as contact offences. And actually, um, I've been completely proven wrong. I think some of the most harrowing cases that I've worked with have been young people who have been sexually exploited online. What I found is that perpetrators can actually be extremely bold in what they ask of young people when they're behind a screen. Um, and young people can be left with long-term physical damage, um, they go through lives living with that kind of fear of when are those pictures or videos going to crop up. And they're much more vulnerable to further exploitation because of blackmail, because of those kind of images um, and videos that, that are still held usually. Um, just put here, perpetrators you may use different ID. So um, an example of this, there was a wonderful young person who I worked with who was very isolated, she was out of education, she lacked friendships, um, she had a really difficult home life, life was really hard for her and she met who she thought was this wonderful peer-aged young person online and um, he was a very very skillful groomer and it went on for a few months and actually he groomed her and then he started to become very manipulative where she started to get a bit frightened by what he was saying and tried to withdraw contact um, to which he would say things, if you don't, if you don't respond, I'm going to kill myself. So she was really pulled in and, and required to do some really horrendous um, things as a result of her sexual exploitation. What he, she thought he was 18 years old, what um, came out as it, as it became a police investigation was that he was actually a man in his 50s. Um, so what my point is, is that perpetrators can be, they can go to great lengths to create very convincing um, ideas. So the nighttime, econo nighttime economy, um, years ago, I'd say about 20, 25 years ago, it wouldn't have been that uncommon to see children stood alongside adult street sex workers on City Road, which is where adult street sex work used to function in Bristol. Thankfully, that's really rare now. It does happen sometimes, but we've got a really vigilant police team um, and we've also got a specialist um, service called 125 who are very, very good at picking up on concerns about under 18. Um, what that does mean though, the nighttime economy, there are still areas where young people are being exploited and it's probably more hidden, which is therefore harder for us to intervene. Um, so adult entertainment venues, massage parlours, pole dancing clubs, so any sort of um, 
area where there is some sort of swapping of money or something for sexual acts, then obviously if they're under 18, and that is very much child sexual exploitation. When it comes to the nighttime economy, what we want to be thinking about is involving licensing and regulatory services. They sometimes have powers that we don't have. Um, what I would highlight as well, there are, you know, often when it comes to this sort of exploitation, there's businesses that can be used um, as a cover to pull children in. So not even necessarily within the nighttime economy. I'm thinking of a, a, a situation from a few years ago where there was a carpet shop um, and actually the carpet shop was just a cover. It was a front um, for the sexual exploitation of children in the back of, of the shop. Um, so what I would be saying is ask questions. If you know, if you've got a young person that you're working with who wants to hang out at a carpet shop every day, that seems a bit unusual, what's going on. You know, if they're going to the same um, fast food establishment a few times a day, I would be really curious, I'd be concerned, I'd be wanting to know what was going on and, and um, looking into that in more detail to see if there is something untoward happening. So party is the next one that we're going to focus on. Um, so a lot of young people and teenagers like parties. Mm. And hopefully most parties are safe, but unfortunately there are some which are not and perpetrators will make the most of these opportunities. So um, children and young people can be sexually exploited at what they refer to as apartment parties um, or in private houses and flats hotels we've got a real issue with children being um, sexually exploited in hotels in Bristol and, and Operation Topaz are completely on it they've got a specific operation to really try and target and upskill and educate hotels to spot the signs um, but if you hear of young people mentioning hotels feed that into the um, portal if, it, if they're not going there if it's in the immediate obviously phone 999 but um, if, it's, if it's kind of just something that a young person has mentioned in conversation and feed it into the portal and I'll, show you, I'll explain the link and how to do that later on. Um, but at parties, um, I guess drugs and alcohol are often given for free, which obviously often it really isn't for free. There's often something expected in return later. Um, but what do drugs and alcohol do? They lower inhibition, they distort memory, um, and they yeah they lower resistance i've tragically lost count of the amount of times that young people have said to me that they've woken up with that feeling that someone has had sex with them obviously that's rape if they can't remember any of it then they've not consented and they've been raped um but it's very difficult then for us to do lots about it because obviously they've, they've got no memory the perpetrators will use that um so i guess at parties there's pictures can be taken videos can be taken to later manipulate and blackmail children with to keep them pulled into further exploitation so it's really common for perpetrators to play on their feelings of shame post parties and um, with all that goes on so the single perpetrator model just going to touch on this briefly it's thinking about grooming really so bernardo's um have have helpfully pulled together what they call a grooming line, which you can access if you look it up on the internet, but it breaks it down into four stages. And my experience is that perpetrators tend to be quite textbook in the way that they um, target and groom and exploit children. Um, so typically there's the targeting stage that can often happen um, without the young person's awareness. So sometimes it could be that perpetrators are communicating amongst each other as they're targeting their victims. They're doing their homework. They're finding out where are the residential children's homes in Bristol? Where are the, the kind of um, alternative provision schools where you're more likely to see more vulnerable children? And then they're, 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 they're doing their research. What does that child like? How can I connect with them? Um, and then there's the friendship stage where they will typically use phrases like um, no one gets you like I do and they'll start to try and isolate them from friends and family. They'll use phrases like oh you don't need to go to school, school's for babies. What I would say is be saying those phrases before the young people do so that that really makes them wake up and think oh hang on a minute what how did he know that he said that or she said that 
um, you know, try and get in there to, to help them to, to recognise what's happening if there is grooming. And then there, it, it develops from the friendship stage into the loving stage where the young person thinks that the perpetrator is their boyfriend or their girlfriend. Um, and um, within that, it may be that they are lowering their inhibitions, for example, by getting them to watch pornography. They're kind of normalising quite abnormal um, sexual behaviour. Um, and then it turns into the more obvious abusive relationship. Obviously, it's abusive throughout, but within that kind of last stage, it might be that the young person is subject to physical injuries, um, that they're kind of raped by multiple people linked to that perpetrator and, and so on. Um, what I would say with grooming is that it, it can be really, really quick. It can also be years. Um, and perpetrators can go to lengths of grooming not only the young person but their family to make sure that they can secure that access to them. Um, there was a situation of a young person who um, she, she, she lived with her mum and her siblings and her father was not in the home um, and a man from a few doors down really befriended the family, got alongside the mum who was really struggling at that point um, without the dad around and just was that that helper, that person that, that she really needed at that point. And he did that for three years before he then started inviting this particular girl to his house um, and started sexually abusing her and exploiting her. And um, she tried to speak to her mum and said she didn't like going there, that she felt uncomfortable and started to try and disclose some of the sexual assaults. And her mum was so horrified and upset that she would even begin to consider saying anything nasty about this man who had helped them that actually this girl went into care because of breakdown of relationships with her family and it was only when she was in foster care and this perpetrator was climbing through her bedroom window to access her that it was then recognized that she was being sexually exploited so that is how clever um, and skillful grooming can be so then um Peer, I've kind of put that at the end because um, obviously peer exploitation involves two children, technically. Um, and what um, we would say in Bristol is if there are if there are two children involved, then there needs to be two strategies. They, you know, both children require a welfare response. Um, be really mindful to appropriately use the term peer sexual exploitation, like I said earlier on, um, an 11 year old and an 18 year old, um, they're not peers, whereas two 15 year olds would be peers. So just make sure you use it appropriately. Um, it's one of the biggest forms of exploitation and um, some research taken in 2017, which is a bit outdated, but I think it's still very similar, the figures now, um, found that 25% of CSE was perpetrated by young people under the age of 18. Um, it's, it's a way that actually abusive adults can use to access young people. They can use peers to exploit and, and set up, um, yeah, and, and, and introduce them to adults. Um, I think one of the real challenges is that if a young person is sexually exploited by a peer, it really sets up distorted norms um, and makes them so much more vulnerable to being exploited in other ways as well and as adults. Um, I was just going to give an example of a young person I worked with who was exploited by a boy who was actually a year younger than her. She was 15 and he was 14. He was incredibly controlling. He limited her freedom. He introduced her to other risky peers as well as adults. He involved her. He was involved in um, facilitating her being internally trafficked multiple times. Um, but it was confusing because he was a year younger than her. And I guess the way that we worked out was kind of assessing that real imbalance of power. Um, as, as if you remember from the definition it, it took us to look out for, there was a real imbalance of power and control within that relationship. So it depends on our assessment of that. Um, so, yeah. So I've just pulled this together. Um, so like we've, We've gone through kind of some of the, the various forms that CSE um, can take. Sadly, they don't tend to just fit in neatly in one model. You might have a young person who's trafficked to a party. If 
by someone who they think is their girlfriend where they're given excessive amounts of alcohol and then raped by um, multiple people there. So what, what, why I do think it is helpful to break it down is that um, we can use our understanding of, of this, um, of the strategies used by perpetrators and the opportunities used by perpetrators um, to inform how we do our planning and recommendations within assessment. Um, so, for example, if it's a grooming situation of a single perpetrator, it might be that we push for a child abduction warning notice or a domestic violence protection order to try and um, disrupt the contact that they and, and their access to that child. Um, we need to be asking questions. So if it's a group, is it organised or is it disorganised? You know, working through that can help us understand what needs to happen to, to increase safety and who might need to be involved. If there's potential trafficking, what information can we gather? Can we get number plates of cars, hotel names, street names, perpetrators um, names, all of those sort of things. What can we do and, and how can we share that information? And, and we'll talk about how we can share that in a minute. So obviously, um, I think it's important to highlight that all young people can be vulnerable to being targeted for CSE, but there are definitely particular cohorts of young people who are very vulnerable to it. And um, I'll just let you have a quick look at that, the ones that are on the screen. What I would like to pull out is neglect. I think neglect in adolescence can sometimes be lost. We don't tend to use the term neglect when we're referring to teenagers. Um, but if you think about a child or a teenager who's being neglected, who's not having their basic needs met, they're going to be so much more vulnerable to, to sourcing them from unsafe places and unsafe people. Um, so neglect is one that we need to be really hot on, on picking up on and responding to. Um, but yeah, what I would say is that over the years I've worked with children from all walks of life all backgrounds, all ethnicities, ages between 10 and 18. Um, and it's, yeah, CSC can be experienced by children with a number of vulnerability factors or by none. But I guess, you know, they, things that can impact um, their experience of CSC can include gender, sexual orientation, identity, race, ethnicity, disability, age, prior experiences of abuse, the degree of family or peer support, just, yeah, that's just naming a few. Um, so if we just think about some of the risk indicators, I'm just going to let them come up on the screen. These are the things for you to be looking out for. And this list is not exhaustive. Um, I'm sure there are many that I've missed off. So I'm just going to pull out a couple. Um, so injuries, it's not uncommon for young people who are being sexually exploited to be subject to physical injuries. Be really vigilant and um, point out if you see things. So I've worked with young people who have got in my car and they've had bruises, they've had cigarette burns, broken jaws, broken backs, broken arms. You know, perpetrators can be very, very physically violent very uncommon for a young person to turn around and say yes he or she did that to me as part of being sexually exploited in fact it really never well very very rarely happens what i would say though um, is that be curious and speak out your concerns so for example um, there was a young person that i worked with who had um, had had her arm broken by a perpetrator and she told me that she broke it by running for a bus and i just said to her I imagine that there might be reasons why you don't feel able to tell me how that really did happen. But my worry is that perhaps it happened because, and I shared my concerns. She obviously took that in. Um, she denied, you know, she wasn't able to agree with me in that moment, understandably, for various reasons. Um, but what she did do was she came back a year later and I had recorded it 
submitted it to the police as well as, as a concern. She came back a year later and said, actually, do you know what, Joe, you were right. And um, he threw me down the stairs when I wouldn't, blah, 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 blah. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, speak out what your worries are because it provides them with opportunities to be able to then speak up. They feel more able to speak up later on down the line. Um, yeah, poor sexual health. If you've got a young person who's repeatedly needing sexual health input, that would be a, a warning sign for me, absolutely. Um, sudden change of clothing. It could be, um, yeah, a, a change in their dress sense. And that alone wouldn't be a worry, but that alongside lots of other risk indicators um, would be something that I would be concerned about. So what is our responsibility? Reporting to the police. So I think it's important to know that there are different levels of concern um, in terms of how quickly you expect a response. So obviously 999 is immediate. I'm sure you all know that. Um, but an example within CSE might be if you had a young person who was being sexually exploited by a perpetrator and there's a child abduction warning notice in place stopping them from being able to have contact um, with that child and you see that child with that person or you strongly suspect that child is with that person, that's a 999 call. Um, 101 um, might be a um, young person has gone missing and they've not returned to their curfew, you can't get a hold of them, you've tried friends, family, places where you think that they could be, um, then you would need to report them missing via 101. Um, I would say the online portal is one that I would use as much as possible. Share any information that you have that could be helpful. However limited you might feel it is, um, I would say that the intel teams within the police are incredible. Some of the, the puzzles that they have put together have just amazed me over the years. Um, so if you overhear, for example, a young person talking about spending time with someone who's called T10, you know, a name which is obviously not their real name, but maybe some sort of kind of street name, because most perpetrators, well, not most, but a lot of perpetrators don't use their real names or use nicknames. Feed that in, because um, there's quite often the police will be able to identify and work out who it is, and that can then enable us to work out creative ways of increasing safety. Um, if you want, I'll just give an example where 101 was particularly incredible alongside the portal. There's a young person who I saw on a Monday after the weekend and it was clear that she'd had a very, very difficult weekend. She came to base and was really quite distressed and she showed me a really big bruise on her arm that she said she couldn't remember how she got it. She knew roughly the area that she was in, but she had no recollection of what had happened. Um, I submitted that as in, intel through the portal um, and later on got a phone call from um, a, a police officer who had noticed that there was a 101 call over the weekend um, where a member of the public had, had phoned into the police concerns about a young person who completely fit the description of this young person running out of an address which happened to be an address of concern holding on to her arm and it was the same arm that was bruised and they were able to kind of put that puzzle together and identify the address and identify the perpetrators that were harming her so even if it seems limited information I would really encourage you to, 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 to um, share it in. So share information with social care obviously is really important so first response um, I've got the, the details on there so through the online portal is kind of the preferred way, but there is also the, the phone number there. Um, if they've got a social worker, share information that you are hearing with them or, or with their families and focus worker. Um, I know that there are colleagues from all different agencies here today and all agencies really should have tools they use to support their assessment. So I know health colleagues who use spotting the signs, police colleagues, you've got the CSE assessment tool and the BRAG and other agencies will use different tools um, and all of these will help inform your assessments. And, you know, if you feel that they, what we can then assess is whether that's a child where there's additional support needed for the family 
or whether that child is in need of protection. Um, and we've also got the Safer Options Hub, which um, really supports kind of interventions um, now around concerns about child exploitation. So I'm just going to quickly point out the survivor pathway. So if you type that into um, the internet, it, it highlights all of the sexual violence support services in Bristol. So it breaks down the support offer, um, whether you're responding to concerns which are historic or current. It, they've got um, details about crisis support, ongoing support, 24 hour helplines, group work, counselling offers. Um, it's a really brilliant website, which I would really highly recommend um, having a look at if you've got young people that you're concerned about because there are some really great resources and agencies in Bristol here to support our children and young people. Um, what I would highlight is that there will be some children who experience sexual harm, sexual assault, who are not necessarily being sexually exploited but the key thing is actually we need to be getting the right support from them um, at that point to reduce their vulnerability them then being sexually exploited so yeah really use the survivor pathway um, and I guess we've all got responsibility around prevention we have a responsibility to support all the children we work with to develop their skills and capacity to identify behaviours that may not be okay and to develop healthy peer relationships so we can all contribute to that in terms of preventative work um, almost at the end keep an eye on the time so this is just um, some learning from young people um, over the years. So the CSA, the Child Sexual Abuse Research Centre, did some great research with young people and the key messages that came out of it were they need an invitation to tell, repeatedly give them opportunities to talk about what's going on, ask questions, be curious, speak out your observations, like I said earlier. They need us to be working together really well, communicating across agencies. Um, they need us to be actively involving carers and parents in safety planning um, and we need to consider and address the many barriers that, that they face to engagement. Um, yeah and I guess I'll just let you have a quick look at some of the other ones that are up there. The one I'm going to highlight is trust your gut. If you've got um, a gut instinct that something isn't okay then there's a chance a high chance it probably isn't and so you know follow that and respond um ultimately what they need is relationships with safe adults and that can be really hard and requires a lot of persistency and a lot of consistency because we're competing against perpetrators who work 24 7 and and can be very very skilled um they need a holistic approach that is a a, that's how we respond to children who are being sexually exploited. We need to consider all of the different needs because all of those needs are going to be impacting their vulnerability um, to, to CSE. They need us to be honest. Um, yeah, I think people really worry about sharing information um, and, and being open with young people when they're sharing information. Actually, my experience is pe young people and children communicate to us when they're not safe because they they feel unsafe and they want us to respond. They often do have to be angry with us if we remind them that we need to share that information, expect fracture. But over the years of experience, I would say also expect repair. They pretty much always come back. Um, and a key thing um, in terms of preventative is quite often sometimes it's just making sure that they've got their basic needs met. Um, you know, when I, um, I would say that um, for some of our really high risk young people can't actually really do much of an intervention with them when you pick them up and they're hungry and exhausted because they haven't slept so sometimes with young people it is literally about picking them up getting them some food going for a drive letting them have a little sleep for half an hour 40 minutes before you can then start engaging in those conversations provide them with that safe place build that safe relationship and then you can start doing the more kind of focused conversations around exploitation so how might you encounter CSE? Um, it could be anywhere and everywhere, to be honest, and it's day and night. Um, but I've just pulled out a few different places here. So parks, houses, flats, um, hotels, CSE hotspots, um, children who go missing. There's a huge correlation between children who go missing and who are at risk of CSE. Um, yeah. And yeah, just in terms of like children's homes, yeah, I guess 
and and schools as well anywhere where there are children particularly children who are known to be particularly vulnerable be really vigilant if there's something that you feel um isn't right speak up about it there's an amazing example last year of a worker um, in one of our children's homes in bristol who spotted a car with a an adult in it acting suspiciously close to the children's home and she took down the registration plate and a description of the car even though there was no child getting into the car there were there were children in that house who were very vulnerable to CSE at the time so she she phoned the police and actually it turned out it was a registered sex offender who had traveled um, from a different city to try and access one of the children that they had met online so she followed her gut and responded she phoned the police and actually they were able to prevent probably a really serious trafficking and sexual exploitation situation we have made it to the end um sorry that was a brief a, a very quick whiz through and i'm aware we've not really left much time for questions i can hang around though if people do have some questions i'm happy to stay on for a little bit longer